40 years ago, I began speaking on what I was very concerned about at the time, a crisis of truth in the Catholic Church. The subtitle was The Attack on Faith, Morality, and Mission. And uh, uh, the book really had a big impact on a lot of people. Monsignor Pope just recently told me that is what helped him to keep his head clear when he was a seminarian and not drift off into confusion. And then a couple of years ago, people began to tell me, Ralph, you should consider republishing A Crisis of Truth. Uh, the Crisis of Truth is back, you know? And so I looked at the book and I said, no, it would require too much updating and I don't have time to do that. And, and then COVID-19 hit and all my travel got canceled. And all of a sudden I had time I didn't think I had. And I also felt like the Holy Spirit started to give me insight into actually a whole new book. It deals with some of the same problems that are back again, but a whole new book in, in light of the current circumstances right now. Another thing happened that uh, really made me feel like this book was needed. Uh, I was invited to give a, a theological presentation at a theological conference at Georgetown University uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of Vatican II. And uh, what happened was that some grad students at Louvain University in Belgium had been reading a previous book I wrote called Will Many Be Saved? What Vatican II Actually Teaches and Its Implications for the New Evangelization that dealt with some of the kind of creeping kind of universalism in the church, which actually ignored what Vatican II actually teaches on the subject. And they convinced their professor, who is head of their department, to invite me to speak at this conference at Georgetown. Well, I showed up at the conference and it was really quite an eye-opening experience. Uh, it was like happy days are here again. Uh, the spirit of Vatican II is back again. Cardinal Casper was the uh, main keynote speaker of the conference and those of you who know him know that he was the, the main advisor to Pope Francis during the uh, two important synods on the family that uh, issued in the uh, apostolic exhortation, I think it is, uh, of Morris Letizia. And uh, the tremendous controversy that's kind of arisen because of that, because there's apparently something that many people consider a loophole hidden in that document that opens up the door for people who are married and divorced but haven't received an annulment to receive Holy Communion. It's caused a tremendous division in the church and tremendous confusion. Not only that, but it's led really leading church people like Cardinal Supertz to say, well, if married and divorced people who haven't received an annulment after appropriate pastoral counsel can receive communion, of course we can't restrict that just to married people. We, we, we have to extend it also to uh, gay couples and other people as well. So a real door got open there that's causing a lot of confusion in the church. So Cardinal Casper was the main speaker, but then Charles Curran, Father Charles Curran, who led the dissent against Humanity Vitae back in 1968 when Pope uh, Paul VI published it. Uh, he had to leave Catholic University because of his dissent, ended up in uh, Southern Methodist, I believe. He was another major speaker there. Another major speaker was Father Roger Height, who had been corrected by the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith for his Christology and the murkiness concerning world religions and the uniqueness of Christ. Another speaker was Father Peter Fon, who also had been corrected by the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. And so I was saying, what is going on here? And later, a couple of years later, I said, you know, they knew what was going to happen under the pontificate of Pope Francis that I didn't know and nobody knew at the time. And, and so that's, that kind of really stuck with me. And so when I had time to take a look at the confusion again, uh, I, I really felt like I need to address it. It's back. And that's what people began saying to me. It's back. We thought it had been really settled by John Paul II. We thought it had also been settled by Pope Benedict XVI. But some of the same confusions about salvation, some of the same confusions about sexual morality, some of the same confusions about sacred scripture were, were back again. So let me talk about some of the crisis I see. What, what, what is the crisis right now that the Catholic Church is going through? Well, one crisis is just simply statistical, but it's not just numbers, it's souls. There's just been a steady decline of participation in the sacraments of the church in the traditionally Catholic and, and Christian countries uh, over the last 40, 50 years. You know, every time new statistics come out, we see more and more Catholic schools closing, more and more Catholic parishes closing. 
uh, fewer and fewer priests who are assigned to cover more and more territory and getting burnt out in the process. And then we see every time a Pew survey comes out, uh, kind of trying to track what Catholics actually believe these days, we see Catholics less and less believing what the church teaches. You know, 40 or 50 years ago, you know, 72% of Catholics thought that fornication was a serious sin. Nowadays, it's less than 50%. Same, same thing with uh, homosexuality and all kinds of other things as well. So, so it's sort of like the Catholic Church is being eroded from within. And I think what's happening is that the influence of the world and the culture is becoming a greater formative uh, influence on Catholics' lives than the teaching of the church. This leads to another aspect of the crisis, the teaching of the church. The teaching of the church is clear. Scripture, tradition, the Catholic the catechism of the Catholic Church is clear. But a lot of priests and a lot of bishops are getting increasingly intimidated about not speaking clearly about those truths of the faith that are in conflict with the culture. There's a lot of reasons for this. Sometimes they themselves have been affected in their own thinking and are uncertain whether the teaching of the church is really that important or not, or even true or not. Other times they become very aware that many people who even come to church on Sunday aren't coming with the mind of Christ and the Spirit of God, but they're coming with the mind of the world and the spirit of the age. And they know if they speak on certain scripture passages that come around in the liturgy every year, people are going to get mad at them. People are going to say, uh, wow, uh, you know, we've got to get with the times. You know, this is old fashioned. The church has got to change in order to accommodate with the culture. I was just talking to a priest who finally decided that he needed to have the courage to tell the truth about sexual morality and four people stood up right while he was speaking and walked out. And so there's a lot of intimidation on, on priests and bishops to be silent about those aspects of the, of the faith that conflict with the culture. We're also finding increasingly that we're no longer living in a post-Christian culture, but we're living in an anti-Christian culture. There's increasing hostility to Christ and the church. What we see now happening all around the world, we see statues being torn down, we see churches being burned, we see Catholics being killed, uh, even in so-called civilized uh, countries, even in the United States and Canada, we see cathedrals being defaced and the Holy Sacrament being profaned, and we're seeing an upsurge of actual violence against Christ and the church. So that's part of the crisis that we're seeing. Now, I'd like to be specific about what particular areas of Catholic truth are really being undermined. First thing I'd like to say is the area of sacred scripture. If we're not sure about the reliability, the inspiration, the inerrancy of sacred scripture, everything's up for grabs. And so when we see everything being up for grabs, we can almost certainly count on people have lost their confidence in the truth of sacred scripture. For example, not too long ago, uh, the head of the Jesuits in, in Rome, when he was being asked about the controversy about marriage, divorced people without annulments, receiving communion, and somebody talked to him about the saying of Jesus about, you know, those who remarry without having a, a, you know, a, a valid reason in Catholic teaching to remarry uh, are committing adultery. What, what the head of the Jesuits said is, well, how do we really know what Jesus said? Were you there with a tape recorder? With that kind of skepticism, with that kind of questioning of the reliability of the words we have in sacred scripture from the witness of the apostles who were formed by Jesus, who were taught by Jesus how to interpret the scripture, who knew the mind and heart of Jesus, we're really cast adrift in a sea of confusion. It's like what St. Paul says in one of his epistles, don't be tossed around by every wind of doctrine. And if anybody comes to you with a different gospel than the gospel I preach to you, even if it's an angel, don't believe him. And here we really need to take a clear look at what the Catholic Church actually teaches about how we should approach sacred scripture. One of the important documents of Vatican II is the Constitution on Sacred Revelation. <clears throat> Excuse me, Dei Verbum. In this Constitution, the Catholic Church clearly teaches the inspiration and inerrancy of scripture. In uh, Dei Verbum, section 11, it says, everything asserted by the sacred authors should be considered to be asserted by the Holy Spirit. 
He's God, by the way, and to teach faithfully, firmly, and without error those truths which God wished to consign to the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. Now, there are parts of sacred scripture that it's hard to understand and hard to interpret, that there's debate about, and that the church has never really ruled on. But so much of the sacred scripture is so clearly asserting truths that there's no doubt about what Jesus and the apostles teach about what we must do to be saved. Those truths are there for the sake of our salvation. We'll be talking about some of them in just a few minutes. But I just want to underline this, what the Catholic Church teaches about how we should approach sacred scripture is that everything asserted by the sacred authors should be considered to be asserted by the Holy Spirit and to teach firmly, faithfully, and without error those truths which God wished to consign to the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. This is important. Our approach to sacred scripture is really important. It's about our salvation. This is where God reveals to us what we must do to be saved. And that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line decision that the human race has to face today. The default situation of the human race is lost, is alienated from God. In order to be reconciled with God, we need to know the pathway that the Lord has laid out for us to be reconciled with God and to end up in heaven rather than hell. Another area that uh, is really under attack right, day, right these days is uh, the area of the importance of Jesus and the church for salvation, the necessity of Jesus and the church for salvation. If I were to describe how many of our fellow Catholics look at the world today, I'd describe it like this. Now, don't, don't, don't panic now. I do know the scripture, but, but listen. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven. And almost everybody's going that way. But narrow and difficult is the road that leads to hell, and hardly anybody is going there. Now, I bet most of you know what's wrong with this picture. Well, what's wrong with this picture is that it's the exact opposite of what Jesus tells us about the situation of the human race. What does Jesus say? Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction. Many are traveling that way. Narrow is the door and difficult the road that leads to life, and few there are who are finding it. Now, let's... Let's pay attention to what we've just seen here. How did so many of our fellow Catholics come to believe the exact opposite of what Jesus tells us the situation of the human race is, apart from him? Well, there's a line in one of the pastoral epistles that St. Paul says to Timothy where he warns us that demonic lies are going to be infiltrated into the church through plausible liars. Now, if I were the devil, what would be maybe my number one lie that I'd like to get people to believe? That it's really easy to get to heaven and really hard to get to hell, and no sweat, don't, don't, don't worry about it. Virtually everybody, if not everybody, is gonna be saved. And if you're not a serial killer, you have nothing to worry about. This is just plain out wrong. It's just plain out not true. Now, us Catholics aren't fundamentalists, so we just can't take one passage in Matthew chapter 7 and, and say that's, that's the whole story. We have to go on in Matthew chapter 7 and read where Jesus says, Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. Well, that's a, that's a zinger. Because there's lots of people today saying, Lord, Lord, claiming to be Christians. You know, I remember one time that I was giving a talk and uh, I was talking about some of the challenging things that Jesus says. Well, Jesus says challenging things not because he wants to hurt us or discourage us. It's because he wants to wake us up. He wants to love us. He wants to show us the true path. So I was talking about some of these challenging things. And a woman came up to me afterwards and she said, my Jesus would never say that. And this, this was a little scary. If you think about it, it's really a lot scary. A lot of people today are picking and choosing from what God reveals to us is necessary for our salvation, judging on the basis of what seems good to them, what, what, what seems sensible to them. And they're forgetting that the Lord says to us, 
my thoughts are so far above your thoughts, my ways are above your ways, you need to pay attention to what I say and not impose your, your limited understanding of things on me. You shouldn't be judging me. You should let my word be judging your thoughts so that you can come into unity and conformity with me. That's why we can never separate Jesus from his teaching. We'll never know the real Jesus unless we pay attention to what Jesus says about himself and how we can come to know him, love him, and follow him. That's why the importance of sacred scripture is so important. You know, Jesus is still a pretty popular figure in our culture today, you know. A lot of people say, uh, Jesus is my hero. Jesus teaches that we should be kind to people. Jesus says we should work for justice, and that's true. That's true. But that's not all that Jesus says. Jesus says, unless you come to me, you will die in your sins. <laughs> Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody can come to the Father except through me. Jesus is making absolutely extraordinarily unique claims about his unique role in, in the history of the human race and in world history. And it's shocking. People don't like to believe it. People don't like to hear it. But it's absolutely true. But Matthew chapter 7 isn't an isolated text. In every gospel, in every epistle, uh, at the end of the Bible and book of Revelation, it talks about the separation of the human race at the end of time. Look at Matthew uh, 19. You know, it talks about the uh, good seed and the bad seed. It talks about sons of God, sons of the devil. It talks about the good fish and the bad fish. You know, it talks about throwing out those who really are, aren't really in union, union with the Lord and don't, don't obey him and don't pay attention to him. Or Hebrews, it says, Jesus became the source of salvation for those who obey him. Oh, we don't like that word obedient today, do we? We don't like to think about obeying. We think it's beneath our dignity that we should be autonomous and we should decide ourselves on what's right and wrong. We should, like Nietzsche says, be beyond good and evil and just choose what seems good to us. What a, what a delusion, what a lie, what a disaster. That's, that's the road to destruction. Jesus became the source of salvation for those who obey him. It's so important that we listen to Jesus. It's so important that we obey Jesus. Uh, Luke chapter 13, uh, people ask Jesus a question. This is a pretty interesting question. Will there be few in number will, that will be saved? Now we might try to guess what Jesus will answer. Like, well, gee, maybe he'll answer, hey, chill. Don't, don't sweat it. I, I didn't mean to alarm you. Uh, you know, don't you remember your scripture classes? I mean, you know, you got to discern literary form. You know, uh, this was Jewish hyperbole. I was just exaggerating. Chill. Well, Jesus didn't say that, did he? But he also didn't give numbers. He also didn't give percentages. But what he said is shocking. It's sobering. We hear it every year in sacred scripture as it comes around in the liturgy. And we're so familiar with it that we're no longer shocked. We're no longer woken up. What did Jesus say? Try very hard to enter by the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter but will not be able to. And the underlying Greek word that we get our English word agonized from says you gotta, you got to really try hard. you got to really work at it. And, and all these parables we've been hearing in the last couple of weeks about uh, the shrewd servant who kind of knew how to prepare his future by making decisions before he got fired from his job and Jesus commending him because he was making shrewd decisions that would assure his future. And Jesus said, unfortunately, the sons of darkness are, are more shrewd than the sons of light who aren't making sound decisions about their future, about their eternal life, about their ultimate destiny. Well, then Luke chapter 13 goes on, and there's a big outcry. People say, wait, wait a second, Jesus. You know, we, we hung out with you in the streets. We ate with you. We, we came to your healing services. We, we, we heard your teaching. Uh, what, what do you mean? Jesus says, I don't know you. Depart from me, you evil ones. Whoa. Wow. How could people hang out with Jesus and not be saved? How could people listen to his teachings and not be saved? Because they didn't enter into personal relationship with him. They didn't believe in who he really is and they didn't repent. They didn't reorder their lives around Jesus. And one of the most 
important things for us to remember today in this time of crisis is that Jesus Christ is Lord. And what that means is that nothing happens in the history of the world that doesn't happen under the providence of God. Nothing happens in the history of the world that he doesn't have a plan to bring good out of. Now, this is a little scary, this is a little shocking, but some of the good that he brings out of what he allows to happen in the world is severe punishment for sin. You know, I just finished reading the book of Jeremiah, then I read Lamentations and Baruch, now I'm reading Isaiah. Honestly, I am in shock about the severe punishment that the Lord gave for, for those who violated his sacred covenant with them, his commitment to them to be their God and them to be his people because of their idolatry, because they forgot him and didn't love him and didn't obey him, because they oppressed the poor, because they committed adultery, because they worshiped false gods. And all those things are back again, even within the boundaries of the church. I think of another image from the prophets where it talks about the hedge being down and the wild boar is kind of rampaging through God's people, uprooting the vine, which is God's people. And I, I think the hedge is down today, brothers and sisters. I think the wild boar is again within the vineyard of the church, rooting up and destroying and dis taking apart God's people and people's lives. But you know what? This isn't just an Old Testament reality. This is something that we see in the New Testament. This is something we see from the mouth of Jesus. You remember when the tower fell and killed a bunch of people and people came to Jesus and said, what, what do you make of this? And Jesus said, they weren't the most evil people in Galilee. They, they, when Pilate killed people in, in their own blood, you know. He says, those people weren't the most evil people in, 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 in Jerusalem. But unless you repent, the same thing will happen to you. The same severe judgment, the same severe punishment. But not only that, listen to this. Jesus doesn't desire that so many people are on a pathway leading to destruction. We know from 1 Timothy chapter 2 that God wills that the whole human race be saved and brought to salvation by knowing the truth. But we also know that God never forces anybody. He never imposes friendship on anybody because what he's looking for is real friendship and real love. He's looking for a paradoxically equal relationship. If you can't say that in relationship to God, but he wants to bring us poor human beings, flesh and blood, fallen creatures, to become partakers of the divine nature. Oh, just think about that for a minute, what it means to be partakers of the divine nature, to actually participate in divinity, to have our mortality swallowed up and become immortal, to, to become, I don't, you know, it's just, it's just it kind of takes your breath away. But the Lord doesn't want anybody to be lost, but he never imposes friendship or love because it wouldn't be friendship or love. Just like in a human marriage, if there's any compulsion in a marriage, if there's any force at all, grounds for annulment, no real marriage took place. In order for a real marriage to take place, there has to be a free giving of one person to the other. The Father is freely giving himself to every human being. Jesus, as it says in the book of Revelation, is knocking at the door, asking to come in and have a relationship with every soul. We'll talk about how that happens in a little while. But unless the door is opened, unless there's a yes to the invitation of Jesus, uh, at a certain point, the door is going to close. At a certain point, the door is going to close. And I think about, uh, you know, uh, back to Luke chapter 13 again. The door closes, and people beat on the door saying, let me in. And Jesus says, the door is closed. When the door closes in our own life, just like it closed on the foolish virgins who didn't have oil in their lamps, didn't have a relationship with the Lord, didn't have the Holy Spirit, didn't have a life of virtue. When the door closes, it doesn't open again. When the door closes on our own lives, we're either going to be in the Father's house or outside the Father's house. 
So I'm so glad for this opportunity today to talk to you about these things because there's no more important decision that any of us have to make than being in the Father's house, saying yes to the invitation of Jesus and becoming part of his body and becoming part of his church, being inside. Now, I gotta tell you another shocking thing that the Catholic Church teaches uh, in the Catechism, the Catholic Church teaches in the Catechism, and also with John Paul II in Vatican II, John Paul II repeated it in his missionary encyclical, Mission of the Redeemer. This is from Lumen Gentium, uh, section 14. It says, there are Catholics who are Catholics in the body of the church, and there are Catholics that are Catholics not just in the body of the church, but in the spirit of the church and the Holy Spirit and sanctifying grace. But then it says, it's really important for Catholics, not just to be Catholics in name only, but unless they act on their belief in their life and their actions, they will not only not be saved, but they will be the more severely judged. Right there in Vatican II, right there in section 14, repeated by John Paul II. It's not enough to be Catholic in name only, but we gotta really live it in, in, our, in our minds, in our hearts, in our actions. You say, where does the church get off teaching that? That's arrogant. Well, if you look at a footnote there in Vatican II, it just lists all the ways in which Jesus says that, some of which we've already commented on here. Now, there is a sickness in the church today. There's a fog in the church, and it's called universalism. And it's the presumption that God is so merciful that he won't let anybody be lost. This is a lie. This is not true. One of the most powerful devotions in the Catholic Church today is the Divine Mercy devotion. And it's absolutely wonderful. I recite the Divine Mercy chaplet myself uh, every time I wake up at night, and if I forget at night, I'll do it the next day as much as possible. It's absolutely true that the overwhelming, dominant thrust of God's attitude towards the human race is immense mercy. And one of the main messages of St. Faustina uh, is that no sinner is more entitled to the mercy of God than the greatest of sinners, and no sinner should ever hesitate to come to the Lord. There's nothing that anybody's ever done. There's nothing no, so horrible or so blasphemous or so ignominious that the Lord is an, so eager to receive those prodigal sons and daughters back into the Father's house. And so if there's anybody listening to this now. And if you're ashamed of your sin and you're despairing of forgiveness and you think you've ruined your life, you haven't. Forgiveness and mercy is available right now. And you right now can cast yourself on the mercy of the Lord. Right now you can kneel down and say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. And at the first opportunity, go to the sacrament of reconciliation. But don't wait. Do it now. But a lot of people don't realize that St. Faustina reported things that Jesus said to her that are really important for balancing out the divine mercy devotion. You know, Jesus told St. Faustina, I, I document it in the book here and I, other places, he told St. Faustina, if sinners don't respond to my mercy, they will be lost. And then Jesus sent an angel to take St. Faustina on a tour of hell and St. Faustina wrote down what, what she saw there. I think it's section 714 or 747. It's right in there again. It's in the book. And, uh, and, and she wrote down what she saw. And she, she said hell was extensive. And she saw many people there. And she saw the kinds of sufferings that people were experiencing. And she said the Lord commanded me to write it down so nobody can say nobody's there. Nobody can say what it was like. You know, nobody in the New Testament talk more about hell than Jesus. Why do we teach about hell in the Catechism of the Catholic Church? Because Jesus told us it's real and he came to save us from there. Okay, now sometimes people say, well, isn't it possible for people to be saved without hearing the gospel? It is, uh, and, and the church clearly teaches that based on Romans chapter one and Romans chapter two. Uh, and in section 16, of the Constitution on the Church, this is where the Church lays out its definitive teaching on the possibility of people being saved without hearing the Gospel. And we really need to know this. We really need to be clear about this because there's so much 
so much confusion here. What, what the council teaches and what we find in the catechism of the Catholic Church is that it's possible for people under certain circumstances to be saved without hearing the gospel. What are those circumstances? What are those conditions? There's three of them. One is that people have to be inculpably ignorant of hearing the gospel. It's not their own fault that they don't know the path to salvation. They haven't heard and it hasn't been their own fault that they haven't heard. Now, sometimes I think a lot of us have experienced, we have friends, relatives, neighbors, co-workers that were concerned about their relationship with the Lord. And so maybe we've had the feeling sometime we've invited them to a talk in a parish mission or something, and we know they're going to hear about something about the gospel, and they know they're going to hear something about the gospel, and they don't want to hear it, and they don't come. Now, only God can judge culpability, but people can be culpable for not hearing the gospel, because they know that the gospel would challenge things in their life and they don't want to be challenged. So the first condition is inculpable ignorance of the gospel. The second condition is nevertheless, they are sincerely seeking God. What does this mean? Romans chapter one says, God has revealed something of himself to the entire human race just by looking at the creation. You can know that God exists and that he's powerful and that he's divine. And then it goes on in Romans chapter 1, it says, however, people didn't thank him or worship him, and they're without excuse because they purposely suppressed the truth. So God turned them over to the disorder that you now see in their lives. People culpably suppress the truth. So that's the inculpable, that's the culpable suppression of the truth. But the Lord expects people that he's revealed himself to through the creation to seek him, to desire to know who is this God? Who created the world? Who, who's there? Who, what does he want? How can I know him? The third condition is people have to live according to the light of conscience assisted by grace. This is based on Romans chapter 2 where it says people will be judged on the basis of the light they've been given. People who know the explicit will of God will be judged on that, and people who don't will be judged on the light that God has given to them through the light of conscience. But now, the most famous theologians of the Catholic Church, when they talk about this area, cite what I just mentioned here without going into detail about the conditions, but they completely ignore the last three sentences of Lumen Gentium 16, which says, very often, human beings exchange it, deceived by the evil one, exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship the creature rather than the creator. Or else giving in to ultimate despair. Uh, they, they, they give in to ultimate despair. And then the conclusion is, therefore, it's urgent that the Catholic Church carry out its mission of evangelization. Now, what the church is basically saying there is that even though it's possible to come into contact with the saving grace of Christ, even without knowing his name, it's very difficult. The conditions are difficult, they're not often fulfilled, and that's why it says very often, deceived by the evil one, we've been talking about the lies that are filling the church and the world today, deceived by the evil one, human beings exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship the creature rather than the creator. That's what's happening when we see the Pew surveys coming back year after year with fewer and fewer Catholics believing what the church teaches. So what the church is saying is that original sin is real. We're, we, we're fallen creatures. We have disordered desires. And without the help of Christ and his church, it's very hard to live a life in light and, and faithful to the light of conscience. And so it's really important that we share the message. So that's one of the, that's one of the chapters in my book. Uh, I better get on to a few other things here because we're, we're running out of time. Another huge area of deception today is in the area of sexual morality. You know, people talk about the 60s as the time that the sexual revolution really kind of erupted and it's had a huge effect on, on many, many people's lives and a huge negative effect. But you know, the sexual revolution is not done yet. It's, it's pushing on in an aggressive way to ultimate victory. And the ultimate victory is that there's no relationship between who we are as men and women and our sexuality, our gender. Now we're getting to the point of denying the, the very structure of creation that God created them male and female and created them to be man and woman and marriage open to life. We're, we're seeing a tremendous attack on marriage and the family. And we remember how, 
how Mary, uh, you know, uh, you know, warned at Fatima about f fashions were going to come into the world that were going to greatly offend the Lord, and that's where that's where Mary also told uh, Jacinta that uh, that wars are a punishment for sin. And, and that we need to say the rosary every day because the world's in danger. And unless World War I ended, World War I was going to end. But unless there was repentance, World War II was going to come. And of course, there wasn't repentance and World War II came. And I don't think we're in a better position today than we were then. And I think the world's in danger. I think the world is in danger today of severe judgment by God. I think the church is undergoing judgment right now. Where our, our, our weakness, our infidelity, our cowardice is being exposed. Our, our sons and daughters are being carried off. One of the punishments we see in the Old Testament is the sons and daughters of Israel are being carried off into captivity. Today we're seeing sons and daughters of the church being carried off into captivity by the world, the flesh, and the devil. Here's where our trust in sacred scripture and the teaching of the church really needs to be spoken clearly today. You know, sometimes people say, why is the church hung up on sexuality? We're not hung up on sexuality, but the world is forcing us to say something, and too often we're remaining silent. What do we need to say? We need to say clearly what God's plan is for human sexuality. We need to teach positively about what a beautiful gift God has given to the human race and human sexuality and what purpose it's there for in holy marriage open to life. But we also need to give the warnings that Jesus and the apostles give, which are not being given today. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul says, I warn you, uh, I warn you, don't let anybody deceive you. The immoral will not enter the kingdom of God. Now the word that's translated immoral there is actually porneia, and in the new uh, translation that's coming out of the New American Bible, it's actually going to be translated this time as sexual immorality. And that's what it's referring to because it goes on to say the fornicator, the adulterer, the person who engages in homosexual activity, the thief, the robber, the uh, idolater, the drunkard will not enter the kingdom of God. Now, if there's ever a clear assertion in sacred scripture, this is it. Of course, there's many, many, many like this. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in harmony with the teaching of Jesus, in harmony with the teaching of all the other apostles, is making very, very clear that sexual sin is a very serious thing. And if we are into fornication or adultery or homosexual behavior, we will not enter the kingdom of God unless we repent. But then the good news is the next verse, Paul says, such were some of you, but you've been set free by the waters of baptism and the blood of Jesus and the sacraments of the church. If there's any of you who have believed the lies of the evil one, if there's any of you listening to this right now who have rationalized, uh, you know, who have, who have made exceptions for yourself, feeling like I love God, but I've got this problem in my life, you know, you've got to repent. You gotta accept the truth. You gotta accept the warning. You gotta know that Jesus is putting this stuff in sacred scripture for the sake of our salvation, that your salvation is at danger. You know, uh, one, of, one of the chapters in my book, chapter five, it says, stop straddling the issue. And this is what the prophet Elijah cried out to God's people, stop straddling the issue. You've gotta get both feet into the kingdom, both feet into the church, both feet into loyalty to Jesus and obedience to Jesus. But 1 Corinthians chapter 6 isn't an isolated text, just like Matthew 7 isn't an isolated text. And I'm so grateful to St. Paul's Center for its tremendous work on restoring confidence in, in, in sacred scripture and the truthfulness and inspiration and errancy of sacred scripture and the tremendous unfolding its richness. So 1 Corinthians chapter 6 isn't an isolated text. Galatians chapter 5. Paul says, and he lists the same similar sins, he says, I warn you as I warned you before. He's doubling down on this. He's saying, this is really important. I'm, I'm reminding you. It's like when Jesus says, amen, amen, I say to you, or solemnly I say to you. This is really important. Wake up. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do these things will not enter the kingdom of God. Ephesians chapter 5. 
the impure person will not inherit the kingdom of God. And it's because of this, the wrath of God is breaking out against those who do these things. You know, brothers and sisters, the wrath of God, what's the wrath of God? You know, it's, it's a human analogy of, of something that exists in God in a way that doesn't exist in human beings, but it kind of points to something that does exist in God. The wrath of God isn't God losing his temper. The wrath of God isn't God being vindictive towards people and getting even. The wrath of God is his immense holiness, not being able to join things to himself and people to himself that are unholy. But it's also the mercy of God desiring to make it possible for unclean, unholy people to become holy through conversion, through repentance, through sacraments, through eating his body and drinking his blood, through living a holy life. But in the, in the Gospels, in the Epistles, in the book of Revelation, in the New Testament, you read about the wrath of God. Sin is serious. I remember what St. Francisco said when, when he was dying. You know, Lucia asked him, what, what most struck you during these last couple of years that Mary was appearing to us? He said, the Lord is so offended by sin, we shouldn't commit even the slightest sin. So brothers and sisters, please, the fear of God is a good thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We should fear offending the Lord. We should fear going to hell. But we should let that fear lead us to a relationship of friendship and love that helps us grow into greater and greater confidence where perfect love casts out that kind of fear and leads us into a tremendous confidence in the salvation that God is working in our life. Okay, uh, I better get on to Pathways Forward. You know, the six chapters in the first part of my book go into a lot more depth than I'm able to do in this short talk about the, the confusion we're seeing, the confusion in Rome, the ambiguity in Rome, the strange things happening in Rome. Uh, and, and I haven't been able to get into that this morning, but there's just a whole chapter of that in the book, and it's, it's really important stuff. A lot of people are confused. A lot of people are telling me, what the heck is going on? And after they read the book, they, they tell me, Thank you. I, I, I know I'm not crazy now, and I can, I can understand what's happening. I can make sure that I don't participate in that confusion. I'm not affected by it. So the book is about what's going on out there, but the book is also about what's going on in here. It's an opportunity to see to what extent we've been impacted by the Lord, by the world, by what time, in what way we've been confused, in what way we have maybe brought some lies into our own life that we can be delivered from and really move forward in confidence and contributing to a, a positive renewal in the church. So part two talks about seven ways that we can respond to this area. And the first one is we got to face reality. We got to not pretend that everything's okay. We got to face the facts that everything isn't okay in so many different ways. And one of the things we're going to find out is that leads us to repentance. We need to repent in our own personal lives for any ways that we've participated in the confusion or we've contributed to it. We also need to be willing to repent of any cowardness or any fear that's kept us back from being a faithful witness to Christ. You know, there's, there's people in our lives whose salvation is in danger. And a lot of times we've been intimidated by how they might respond to us from saying anything uh, or, or we've been afraid to say what the truth is. We've had people come and they're living in those kinds of relationships that Scripture says could exclude them from the kingdom of God. And we just kind of by our silence sort of almost kind of give approval to them. We've got to repent of any cowardness where we haven't been a faithful witness to Christ. doesn't mean we've got to jump in every time we think somebody's living in sin and say something about it. But we need to be open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We need to examine our heart. We need to make sure we're speaking the truth in love. We need to make sure there's love there, not just a holier-than-thou attitude or, or arrogance or pride or anything like that. I think of what Paul said when he says, I, I, I tell you this with tears, that some people have made themselves an enemy of Christ. I say this to you with tears. So if there isn't physical tears, at least there has to be sorrow in our heart, tears in our heart, where we are sincerely sorry for the possibility of somebody going to hell because we love them, which leads us to speak the truth in love when the Lord gives us an opportunity for it. 
and to repent of any ways in which our cowardness has held us back. Yes, it, it's risking. It's taking a risk. But we're taking a bigger risk by not speaking, approving somebody's path that leads to destruction. Another thing we need to talk about is pastoral passivity. Quite honestly, brothers and sisters, if 30 or 40 years ago Catholic bishops had spoken out when the first Catholic politician said, I'm supporting abortion legislation, and said, you know, you can't do that and be a faithful Catholic, uh, we would not be in the horrible situation we're in today. We've got to start speaking out. One of the things that Paul tells bishops to do in the New Testament is admonish the sinner publicly so that others won't sin. We've had precious little public admonishment of public scandalous sinners. And that's, that's a big problem. And one of the reasons why we're here today is because pastoral foolishness, pastoral passivity, pastoral cowardness, and we've just got to have bishops and priests wake up and begin to give a certain sound from the trumpet. Paul says when the, certain, when the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who's going to come for battle? So few people are really waging spiritual war today because we haven't had a clear sound from the trumpet. We need to have the word of God spoken clearly with power, with authority, with the prophetic zeal of Jesus when he overturned the, te uh, the, the tables in the temple. And, and people remembered what the scripture says, zeal for his father's house consumed him. We need to have zeal for the father's house consume our pastoral leaders, so many of which are good men, but have been intimidated by the culture. We also need to take action. We need to be willing to speak up, like I said, when people's salvations are at stake, but we also need to speak up when stuff is being said in our parishes or our religious education programs that aren't right. We need to not just move on to another parish saying things are better there, but we need to take some responsibility to speak up. We have to do it respectfully. We have to do it understanding that maybe we haven't correctly understood what was being said in a sermon. We need to go to the priest or deacon and say, Gee, it seems like uh, what you just said is, is not what the Catechism of the Catholic Church says. You know, did I hear you correctly? We need to do it humbly. We need to do it respectfully. But if the person blows us off and says, oh, the church has got to get with the times and, you know, uh, it just doesn't pay attention. And if it's a serious matter, you know, it's not just a matter of, you know, how many genuflections somebody did or whatever. But if it's a serious matter about faith or morals or serious irreverence for the liturgy, uh, we need to go to the bishop. Now, I've got to warn you, the bishop is not going to be happy to hear from you. The bishop may not want to hear from you, but you have a responsibility to go to write a letter. And if the bishop blows you off, then it's between him and God. You know, we all are going to have to give an account to the Lord for our faithfulness in passing on the teaching of Christ in the church. And that's why James says in his epistle, not many of you should become teachers because teachers are going to be held to a higher account. I'm really happy to say that I see signs of hope. I see a lot of wonderful things happening. I see a lot of, a lot of brothers and sisters rising up in, in, in clarity about the faith. I see a lot of tremendous Bible studies going on and prayer meetings. I see things happening on the official level of church that are very encouraging also. And the Diocese of Lansing, I see a tremendous uh, uh, whole year pr praying for a new Pentecost for the diocese and tremendously strong efforts for new evangelization. I see the same thing in the Archdiocese of Detroit where I teach at the seminary. I, we've had a really tremendous uh, solemn liturgy of repentance where, where the Archbishop Vigneron led us in a very, very honest, very sincere, very, very real repentance for things that have gone on in the Archdiocese of Detroit that have allowed a lot of Catholics to be swept away in their faith and took a lot of courage to do that. And he did it in a very forthright way. And now, of course, once you repent, you need to kind of make sure you keep on repenting and don't fall back into the same stuff. And that's true individually as well as corporately. The last chapter of the book is my favorite chapter. And what it talks about is the inexhaustible riches of Christ. We should have tremendous hope and tremendous confidence because Jesus Christ really is the Lord. He really, really is. And like I said just a little while ago, nothing happens in the church or in the world that doesn't happen under his providence. And he's got a plan to bring good out of it. Uh, a couple months ago, I, actually while I was writing the book, uh, I came across a prophecy from Father Michael Scanlon 
you, many of you know him as the, the president of Franciscan University who over a long presidency turned the university around and made it one of the most incredible Catholic universities in the world today. He gave a prophecy way back in 1976, and it's, I, I did a YouTube video on it. You could just kind of like uh, search uh, Father Michael Scanlon prophecy, Ralph Martin, or Renewal Ministries. And then he said that things that you've depended on aren't going to be there. The, you know, the, the money you've depended on isn't going to be there. The buildings you've depended on isn't going to be there. The country you've depended on may not be there. The, the churches you depend on, the doors may be closed. Who would have thought that we would have seen that, you know, back 40 years ago or 44 years ago? But the last line of his prophecy is really hopeful. He says, when you see it all shut down, and who ever thought we would see it all shut down? Who would ever thought we'd see the whole world shut down, maybe even going to be shut down again? Who ever thought we'd see the churches shut down, people deprived of the Eucharist for so many months? But we have, and we've seen it. But here's the last line. It says, when you see this all shut down and you've come to rely only on me, and that's the message of a time of confusion, a time of crisis. It's a, it's a wake-up call to examine our priorities. Is Jesus really Lord of our life? Are we really obedient to his teaching? Are we really living in fervent friendship with him? So it says, when you see these all shut down and when you've learned to rely only on me and not on these other things, even your country, even your economy, even your buildings, then you will see what I am about. That's exciting. The Lord's about something and allowing this purification and allowing this judgment and allowing this confusion. Maybe it's a separation going on that we read about so often in the scripture between the sons of the devil. Hey, hey, I didn't use that language. Jesus used it. And the sons of God. It's so important that we accept the friendship that Jesus is offering us and that we repent if necessary and we live a life of fervent f friendship with him and bold witness.